Nick, I think it was, uh, I don't know, Jeff Bezos who once said that um, every big thing started with a small idea, which when you think about what has happened with that company, um, those small ideas have turned into huge changes in the way a lot of us shop. Um, you've gone from doing it all yourself to now you've said to me before we started recording this conversation that you've had something like a hundred million lifetime revenue with your organization. Uh, tell us your story. How did you start this thing? How did, what was the, what was the seed that got it going? And then how did you, second part would be, how did you scale it from you doing everything, you know, probably washing toilets and picking up phone calls yeah. and managing clients to now, as you say, you're not doing as much as you have. You're sort of working yeah. the business versus being in the business. So start off with your story and then how did you scale it? Yeah. So I'll try to do the, the TLDR here. And so we don't go, you know, too, too much in the weeds, but, um, so I started RP Strength with uh, one of my best friends from college. He was a couple years ahead of me. Uh, he went on to get his PhD. He's known as Dr. Mike. He's become quite the kind of internet celeb in the in the fitness space. But uh, we really just started as two coaches. And before that, really as personal trainers in New York City, in Manhattan. And kind of realized we didn't want to do that long term. So he went back to school to get his PhD. And I was still training people in person. And we sort of kept just referring people back and forth because he was working with people online. I was working with people in person. And then one day we were just like, hey, why don't we just like start a business where like, we're actually in business together rather than just saying, hey, go work with my friend. And so that was really it. Like that was our little tiny idea. And if you would have told us back then that we'd be helping literally millions of people around the world, we'd be like, oh, uh, that seems a bit far fetched. But it really just was that love of fitness early on. And we just wanted to help people. And we thought that, you know, this is, let's call it 2011, 2012, something like that. There wasn't this approach to fitness based on evidence back then. And so that was really our big thing. Like we thought we had a little bit better way to do it. You know, he, my buddy being a, a PhD, he's, he's the science guy behind everything. We thought that we could systematize things a little bit better. So for hmm. example, you know, if you were to hire me to be your nutrition coach, I sort of know what I'm going to do based on what, how and when you stall out along the way, assuming you're you know, following the program. Of course, that's a big caveat, right? But so we thought to ourselves, okay, well, like we can work with people online. We don't have to do in person. That's one way to scale it. But you're still kind of capped to how many people you can work with yourself or any one coach can you know, have, I don't know. 50 people they work with, let's let's say. So you're still capped. And then in order to scale, you would have to hire on a ton of coaches. So we thought, can we systematize this into a digital product? And so we did uh, like a digital ebook first. And that sold like a couple thousand copies the first week. Light bulb goes off. Oh, there might be something to this. Okay. Mm. And which, by the way, we didn't even sell it on our own website. We didn't even have a website at the time. We just like took PayPal payments from you know people paying us to be their coach. We sold it on a third-party site. So again, didn't really know what we were doing, but thought we could help people. Thought we had some some pretty cool stuff. And then once that sort of light bulb went off, we said, "Hey, how can we scale the one-on-one -on -one coaching model? Because we can scale our information. We can just sell an ebook, and that's one thing. But can we systematize this process that sort of has these algorithms in place? Where okay, if you do this, then I know I can kind of do this in order to keep you on track. And so we created these diet templates in February 2015 is when we launched them, and they did okay. But about three months later, uh, people started sharing their results on social media with them. And that's when they really started to take off. And that was when we saw kind of that like hockey stick. Because if you think about it, what we were offering was a product that you could buy for $100 versus having to pay a coach several hundred dollars a month. So instead of six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars $900 for a three-month time period, let's say, you could spend 100 and so that really took us to the next level where we could then sell thousands, if not tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands. And kind of in our mind was, all right, so we've kind of proven this concept works and digital products are highly profitable. So we started taking that money, reinvested it back into the company, building out an app on the back end to, you know, here we are in 2024, we have two apps. So we have one for nutrition, so our RP Diet Coach app, and then mm -hmm. we have one for uh, weight training, which is called the RP Hypertrophy app. I love it. So it's just interesting that you've been describing this app and taking this content that was used to be developed and designed as an in-person experience to now that something digital, even our company is, is looking to ways in which to do that. 
I've always wondered, though, and I, I'm going to play the devil's advocate, and I wanted just to have you come back to me and share with Please. me your experience on it, because there is something um, intrinsically useful, at least in my belief system, about in a live experience. Mm-hmm. Take, for example, you know, in a an environment where companies had to go to had to go to Zoom and WebEx during COVID, and we yep. were sequestered in our our offices, our bedrooms. And we're holding eight hours worth of meetings all day. And yet we were efficient. It was it was cost savings. People didn't have to spend money on mm-hmm. gasoline uh, for their cars. Uh, child care yep. became a thing of the past almost because, Man, you know, sure. we could almost do it all. I mean, it was really a great mm-hmm. thing. And yet the, the downside of all that was 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 that intimate connection with other people. You know, there's only so much we can do through a digital platform. And um, I guess my question is, do you, in a sense, how, how do you address the social aspect that yeah. going to the gym would provide or working with a yeah. personal trainer? Um, I, I spent a lot of years in Kempo Karate and I knew that part of the reason why I was going to the mat three times or four times a week mm-hmm. was not just for the physical aspect of it, but the community that we were creating together. Totally. It would have been hard pressed to be able to reproduce that in some sort of an app. So how do you respond to the social aspect of fitness, mm-hmm. given the fact that you've done really well with the digital platform? Yeah. Yeah, you're totally spot on. And there's a couple of things to say on that. And one, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit um, what exactly we do, because I think it ties into marketing. So our target market is people that are, I would say, intermediate or advanced in weight training. Mm-hmm. We're not for beginners. Okay. So and a lot of times for beginners, we couldn't do what we do very well if it was beginners, because you have to teach some stuff in person. You have to know the right form, for example, something like that. So a lot of times like that, we actually encourage people like, hey, go find a local gym, find a trainer, do some of that stuff in person, learn the basics, learn how to move a little bit, understand that for, you know, three, six months or whatever. And then you're probably ready for an app because what we do is is do it yourself. And so you have to already pass that bar of you're already intrinsically motivated, more or less, because mm-hmm. if you're relying on an, ex, an app to, to motivate you, uh, that's, that's a slippery slope. So that's where we come in for people that are a bit more serious. And that's actually, you know, it's totally by design because the target market that we're after, you know, like, well, I'm a very serious lifter myself. Uh, so is my co-founder, Dr. Mike. So it's a vast majority of people that work at our company. And so those are the types of people that we go after where they're like, you know what? Like, I just, I want to spend my time most efficiently in the gym. Like I want the best results. I don't want to hop around thinking, I don't know, like so-and-so influencer said, do X, Y, and Z. He's like, no, 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 no. You're coming to RP because we've got the evidence-based approach. We know exactly how to get you results. RP, we kind of joke that uh, technically stands for Renaissance Periodization, which is a really long name. You know, never planned on it becoming, you know, uh, I don't say household. I don't mean household name, but in the fitness space. Uh, so we just go by RP now, but we kind of jokingly refer to it as results, period. That's what we do. We're, we're the best in the world getting people results and, you know, transforming their physiques. And that requires kind of already this interest in it, not us teaching you the the basics, so to speak. Although we give so much free information out online on our YouTube channel, for example, that you can just start there and you can learn a ton. And then when you get that baseline understanding, then it's time to come use our apps because they're definitely not designed for beginners. So that's interesting. I mean, one, I, I see two paths here. One is this path for those people who are listening, who are very much interested in uh, their physical fitness, their nutrition, mm-hmm. and, you know, more power to you. This is fantastic stuff. I could also see there's some sort of lessons learned about using a digital platform after someone is motivated. Mm-hmm. So think about a company, think about a team who's maybe their focus is not around physical fitness or nutrition, right? They're doing other things at work, but this we're still in the post COVID conversation, even today about do we have everybody back at work do we have some sort of a hybrid approach do we say come in two days do we come in four days do we come in one day go come in and go as you see please because the results are what we're what we want you to do or or not do do we lose our culture because we don't 
happenstance connect with pe people over, you know, the water cooler. You know, what is culture these days in a world of a digital opportunity, not only for physical fitness and, and, and um, you know, nutrition, but what is culture when it comes to, you know, other social interactions that we have, be it at work, be it at home. What's your take on all that? Because you've obviously are doing quite well leveraging a digital platform. How do you philosophically wrap your arms around this movement that seems to be taking shape in many different areas? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And uh, I think you're right. It does go back to culture. So we were actually completely remote before COVID. So we mm. were always kind of seeing as like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean you're all remote? And I was like, well, it's just kind of how we work. So I think that goes back to our particular culture and the types of people that we want. So we're okay with having smaller teams that are probably folks that are a bit more senior that can operate better on their own. So if we were to hire someone at RP, if they need a lot of handholding and kind of like, oh, you know, over the shoulder guidance and oversight, they're probably not going to do very well at RP. So that's definitely mm. the type of person that we go out and seek when we're you know, trying to recruit and hire. And a lot of that goes back to we recruit. Now, again, you know, we're not some massive Fortune 500 company. Like we, you know, we're, we're okay with a smaller, leaner team. And that just kind of, I think, all ties into it because these types of people are kind of self-motivated already. And so yeah. they can work remote because we do just kind of care about results at the end of the day. And, you know, like we've got one engineer, an, an example, that like, likes to work crazy hours overnight and he lives on the west coast and we're like okay like more more power to you and then we've got a couple of people that work around the world and you know they kind of know that they have to work maybe a little bit later just to to be on sort of you know u.s time zones to, to catch some meetings and calls and you know so the trade-off they're okay with so i don't know that's how we approach it again i can only share from my experience right because if i was trying oh, to yeah, run yeah. some you know, Fortune 500 company, I would probably yeah. be thinking quite a bit differently. So that's just kind of my perspective on it. But it is an interesting, you know, it's an interesting hypothesis, you know, that totally. people who are motivated, maybe uh, who have a clear direction, um, and maybe the work doesn't require a ton of collaboration with other people working remotely, working on a digital platform, in your case, works very well. And um so tell me a little bit, if we go back to more your business and your ability to scale, you started off by mm -hmm. saying, you know, I was doing everything. Now I'm doing not as much and the company is growing. Um, it sounds like the, the, the really the, the vehicle for that expansion was the digitization of your business. You know, those platforms that you talked about, mm -hmm. whether other things that you found were important in terms of your scale, for example, social media, how have you been able to leverage the marketing aspects of a digital tool. Yeah. I mean, when you were thinking, when you were saying that, the first thing that popped in my head was, yeah, the, the biggest you know, digital platform we use and leverage was social media. And so we we were probably early in the game uh, in terms of Instagram and fitness. And so for the longest time, like what worked for us was before and after pictures of our clients. Mm. People loved them. They were always the most most engaged, the most liked posts, the most comments, people bank, oh my gosh, how do I get started? You know, all that. And then, you know, as things happen, things change. And Instagram was like, hey, you know what, before and after, nah, they no longer work. And so we did have to pivot. And the, the fun thing about, because I used to run our Instagram for the longest time up until a few years ago, is I always just treated it like a game where it's like, you're just testing a bunch of stuff. You see what works and the stuff that works better, you do more of that. The stuff that doesn't work, even if it's some of your favorite stuff, you just do less of it. And so you definitely have to keep that in mind when you're doing social media. You can't go in thinking that, you know, it's only one way to do it. Like there's a lot of testing and tinkering with it. And so like Instagram was great for us for the longest time. And then it kind of stopped. And then hmm. when COVID hit, we made a intentional pivot where we had this paywalled uh, content that sort of lived, you know, you had to pay a monthly fee to get in. You could, you could access it. But we thought, you know what, COVID, everyone's going to be at home, especially a lot of people in the fitness, right? Because all gyms were closed more or less. And so we're like, okay, everyone's going to be at home. People are going to need stuff to do. What can we do? We're like, you know what, this gated content, it's all free now. It's all free. You can come access it at any time. And guess what? Now we're going to start intentionally distributing it onto YouTube. And at the time, we maybe had 30,000, 40,000 subscribers on YouTube, nothing crazy. But the thing that we have going for us, and again, I'm only sharing my experience, and not everyone will have this exact same experience, is that uh, my co-founder, so Dr. Mike, has what I like to call the gift of the gab. And he's very good at educating people, but infusing humor 
into it. And so people, they learn a lot from it and they're like, it's not boring. It's not dry. And that's what you have to have when you're trying to uh, teach people stuff because people love it. They're like, oh, I'm so engaged. This is so interesting. I want to keep coming back. And so like, those are the two things that started to line up. We kind of dedicate a lot of our time into YouTube. And so it went from like being really Instagram heavy to, okay, that sort of stopped working. Now we have to pivot into something else. We put a lot of our resources into YouTube. And the interesting thing about YouTube on, on how they monetize is they pay you to create content. And yes. so we're always incentivized to keep creating more and more content. And then it's just a free way, not even free. They pay us to promote our own products within our content. That's like, it's hard to see how that model is going to lose. And so that's where we've become really big the last few years. And uh, yeah, currently right now, we're the number one fitness channel on all of YouTube. Hmm. How often do you post? On YouTube? Uh, yeah. Essentially every day. Yeah, you'd have to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is, what's the uh, the guideline in terms of how long these posts can be? I mean, I've heard all sorts of things. Uh, well, so there's a couple different types of content. So uh, longer form content is posted every single day at noon, Monday through Friday. Uh, there's a video on Saturday that goes out that's just exclusive to our like sort of uh, – premium members uh -huh. and then there's a bunch of shorts that go up throughout you know the week at various times i don't know the exact on the timing our, our team sort of figures all that out uh, but there's a lot of analytics going on behind the scene too like we've got a whole we've professionalized our youtube operation it used to be a bit more fly by the seat of your pants but then we really started getting serious about it. We've got a YouTube director. We've got two editors under him. And mm -hmm. then we have uh, another gentleman that uh, really just creates thumbnails for us. And so there's a lot of A-B testing behind the scenes to see like what's going to work best and all that. And you know, seeking out tons and tons of different uh, collaborations with other people. And the insights that these folks share has been incredibly valuable as well. So what's next? What's the five-year goal? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to get that. So uh, part of it is maybe not expanding, but really doubling down on the stuff that works really well for us, because I would love to hear your take on this too. But as you start to do better and better, you get more and more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it is hard to say no, because you're like, well, yeah, I can justify it. that's That's a good idea. But then what you really have to do is you really have to start looking at the ROI. Again, this is at least in my experience. And you're like, huh. All right, well, let's say what we have going on is a, a million or multi-million dollar kind of thing where we can focus. And so, well, this new opportunity is thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. Well, how much time should we put into that? And, you know, again, it's hard to say no to people because you're friends with other folks and they have good ideas and they can pitch it. And you're like, yeah, that sounds really exciting. And it's just really hard to say no. If you can say no more often, you can stay focused on the bigger things. And that has really led us to some some pretty serious growth here the last like year, year and a half is kind of staying disciplined on that. And I found that to be exceptionally hard because I can rationalize all sorts of things in my mind of like, yeah, sure, we should do that. And you're like, but the the marginal opportunity cost isn't quite worth it. So it's really, really hard. And I, 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 I'm literally, I'm saying this. So it's a reminder. I just, if I say it enough times, yeah. I think out loud, it'll kind of sink into my own head. I'll make, I'll kind of, you know, catch myself when, when some of those opportunities arise. Well, I hear you a hundred percent. I, I, I kind of have the same sort of uh, curiosity addiction, <laughs> you know, it's so mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. so that oh, you know, yeah. we're writing a book right now. And I told this poor gal, I said, I don't envy you because you need to sort of get into my brain and hear all of my ideas and then somehow yeah. make it into a shape and a concise sure. message. And like, I, I've spent 30 years thinking about a book and now we're finally doing it. And it's because of that curiosity obsession that I have. And I do say yes to a lot of things just like you yeah. do. But I think that when I, when I think about the best practices that we've been able to help other companies do, we were we would say even though we don't always subscribe to it we're trying to learn from our own mistakes like oh, anybody yeah. else yeah don't worry. We, which is yeah. to say really get clear about what's the criteria for saying yes and what's the criteria criteria for saying yeah. no and in really dispassionate forget relationships and your best friend and your wife's girlfriend and all the other things and or your client that you're so <laughs> in love with because they've been with you since the day that you started but just really get out of the relationship piece just for a second and go, what's the criteria for saying yes? What's the criteria for saying no? Yeah. And I remember, I don't know, it was probably Michael Gerber. I think it was, or one of, 
I don't know, one of the marketing gurus many, many years ago was saying that the higher up you go and the more successful you become as a business or as a person in a business, the more you're going to have to say no. You're going to say no more than you're going to say yes. And I coach people all the time on this. Like when you get to a mid-level manager level and they are the high flyers, you know, they are the ones that are being seen as the the talent that's going to take over the ELT in the company. Um, they are in a wonderful place, but they're in a very precarious place too because everybody wants their time. They are known and have a brand around execution and getting things done, getting things done well. And so what we want to do is load them up and load them up and load them up. And I know of one particular company that we absolutely adore, but there's probably four people on the executive team that we would call unicorns because they've been loaded up so much that when you replace that one person, you'll have to find three to do their work. And they're kind of like incredible executors and ability is off the charts. However, it's not sustainable for them, nor is it sustainable for the people who are going to be replacing them. So it goes back to this idea, Nick, that I agree with you 100% is being able to say no is is really strengthens your yeses more yeah. than anything. Well, so, yeah, I mean, literally I was having some conversations yesterday with some, uh, you know, couple of our folks on our exact team and i was like what, what was that quote that, that someone said that, uh, it's either a hell yes or it's a no and i'm like man i gotta start you know applying that because yeah i get some opportunities whatnot but you know really my uh my co-founder you know dr mike has become so well known now in the fitness space that he's just getting bombarded daily yeah. and so to me it's an exercise in reminding him of like well, what are the one or two things that we can do like world class at? And that's where we got to stay focused right. because right. we can take on, and, and again, we've done it in the past. I've seen it. I've seen us kind of stall out for a couple of years because we tried to do so many different things. And then when we started getting rid of some of those smaller things and focusing, doubling down back on the, the couple more things, which are apps. Yeah, here we go. We're kind of back on that, uh, that hockey stick. And it's like, oh, okay, this is how it works. Okay, gotcha. Good reminder. Yeah, and with your with your friend, your doctor partner, you know, it seems that the more there's demand, the more you can create scarcity for that demand and therefore say no. Meaning like, so glad that you guys asked for my time, but before I would have given it away, hmm. now it's going to cost you X, you know, or, yeah. you know, all of a sudden you can monetize that request, that desire for one's time. And then, of course, that's going to reduce the number of people who have yeah, access yeah. to you because exactly. not everyone's going to want that. But then you digitize mm -hmm. everything else to make it more affordable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I just heard an interesting story, too, from someone I had dinner with last week where, uh, I don't know about you, but I get, I don't know, a handful of you know these like spam marketing emails every single day. And every so day. this guy was like, you know what I did? He's like, I just made a Calendly, and in order to get a spot in there, you had to pay $500. And so wow. like all these people that were reaching out, he's like, I just throw them that link. And if they're serious about it, they'll pay for it. And he's like, well, best case, it's something I'm actually interested in. And then they make that money, you know, way back tenfold or whatever. And, uh, you know, if they're not interested or it's not something we want to do, well, like, well, I made 500 bucks for that hour. I was like, huh, that's a really interesting way to go about that's it. That's not a bad idea. And it may not even be you that has to take that call. It could be somebody on your team. Sure. I love that. Idea. Uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I mean, whatever. And people can scale it too to their own kind of dollar amount. Like, okay, well, maybe it's not 500, maybe it's 250. Or like, you know, maybe it's just even like a hundred bucks, right? Because you get mm -hmm. all these people that want to pitch you and it's like, well, all right, how serious are you about pitching me? Well, you, yeah, you got to right. pay at least something, which interestingly enough, I don't want to side tangent here, but this actually does go back to fitness. So we actually changed something in our own pricing structure where uh, for the longest time, our diet app had a two week free trial. And it just happens that I never loved it, but I understood why we were doing it. I'm like, okay, whatever. And then at one point I said to myself, you know what? I'm tired of all these people that come in and they're not serious about it. And they'll play with the app for five minutes and they quit because fitness is a hard thing. It requires some time, investment, commitment. And I'm like, you know what? Let's get rid of our free trial. You want in, you got to pay us. 
Yes. You got to have some skin in the game right off the bat. And yes. that uh, has turned out to be to, to work pretty well for us. Uh, you know, some people will complain about it, but I don't even get uh, upset about that anymore because I say, you know what? That probably means we're on the right track because we want people that are interested in committing to themselves and the people that do that have some skin in the game, their chances of following through the program and being more successful goes up. So that those are the types of it's people that we want. It's a really interesting. So I've got a really close friend of mine um, who has this um, very successful Kempo Karate studio out of Phoenix. And you know, he's really world-class facilitator, awesome. seventh degree black belt. I mean, and I think he's just um, a very special individual. And in one hand, I think he loves to see the light bulbs go off. You know, the, that first initial, oh, my God, I, I, I have a sense of awareness of myself and my abilities that I never knew that I had. So it's like it's, it takes the, <laughs> the novice and all of a sudden they, they, they go to the next level of their self-awareness. And he loves to see that where that's a great wonderful mission I, and I, I so appreciate that and you don't have people necessarily at that high level who are already motivated you're working at the lower level that's getting to that point right so it's almost like if you were to take that model that you just described and create an app around that it would be you let's focus on those brown belts those black belts who are already vested who already yeah. have skin in the game who already know the benefit and we're going to go from there on up versus from those who are brand new have never tried to be on a map before at all you know like somebody who never picked up dumbbells you never picked up weights before that's a whole yeah. different clientele right it is yep yeah and I guess there's all of that can be translated back into motivation on work, whether it be fitness and nutrition or not, and, and whether you use something digital, Zoom or otherwise. Have you ever connected with um, the, uh, the Blue, Zoom, Blue Zone movement and uh, know about what that's all about? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm pretty well versed in it. Uh, I haven't okay. seen like the Netflix documentary, but um, I, I there was a period where I sort of read like all the longevity books, and Blue yeah. Zones was one of them. Yeah. So the best that I can kind of describe that, like, is there anything you know special about those particular areas? Uh, uh, maybe, but you start looking at all of them, right? What do they all have in common? And what turns to be, at least in my opinion, so there's a couple things that stand out. And I think this is applicable to everyone. So a lot of those blue zones, they're not eating a ton of processed foods, which, okay, great. That's a good way to limit calories because you start getting more processed foods. And what's good about processed foods? Well, you know, good in the sense that they taste delicious because they're manufactured to taste delicious and we want to eat more of them. Makes sense. Right. So you just eat more, you know, fruits, vegetables, lean meats, all that stuff. Wonderful way to go. Absolutely. It gets you eating healthier, and it's really hard to overeat in terms of calories on eating foods like that. So check. A lot of them check that. They're also very active. So what was uh, one was, uh, uh, what was it, Sicily or Malta, I believe, was one of them. And Correct. You know, they're talking about the, the hills. All that, the that streets are going and, up and down. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so you start to look at all this stuff, and you're like, okay. So they're not eating a ton of calories because uh, they're, they're eating mostly healthy foods, non-processed, and they're moving a ton. So what are the two biggest things when it comes to controlling your weight? It's calories in, calories out. Okay, well, you're controlling how many calories are coming in, and you're also eating a ton. So you're expending a ton of calories. And it, it's no mistake why, why those are blue zones and they typically live longer. Are there probably some more variables in there? Probably. Absolutely. Is it maybe a little bit of genetics? Could totally be. Because, you know, sometimes people can do all the right things and genetics would say, hey, you're going to have a, a heart attack when you're, you know, 50. And that's just unfortunate right. uh, well, downside of genetics. But you kind of have to look at the bigger picture. And, and the, the, that would be my, my biggest takeaways from those. Yeah. I mean, was it was it Roger Bannister who broke the uh, world record yep. on uh, the mile and he ended up dying of a heart attack, right? I mean, I think that mm. was the case or somebody who was in that particular run. Sure. Distinction. Yep. So you're right about the Gen X. I think the other components of Blue Zones, I don't have it. I've got a few books on it, but I know that mm -hmm. the two things you just mentioned were very much important. Another one was community. Oh, yeah. Meaning mm -hmm. connection. Totally. So it kind of goes yep. back to that theme about being with people, being mm -hmm. yep. in relationship with people. And they had a lot of different examples of multiple generations all working and living mm -hmm. together, um, having the people, you know, your post person, the 
person who does your, your butcher, you know, just having a community sense. And I know that with yep. COVID, it was interesting. That was a, one of the things that we lost as a, on mass, oh, yeah. you know, was community and except in smaller pockets. And so in our little community here in my neighborhood, we ended up developing some absolutely lifelong relationships because we had no other option. It was the neighbor yeah. next door. And now we travel yep. with them and we love them to pieces. Um, I think the other one of them is uh, purpose. You know, having a life purpose, yeah. maybe being really yeah. clear about what your direction is, what you're calling, uh, what's your highest and best. And and and, uh, and, it, and interestingly enough, I think a glass of wine was one of them. Sure. That, uh, what, there was a, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, to, to me, that not almost ties in. Yeah. Not getting that, drunk, but a little bit. Yeah. 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 That goes into the social part. Well, a lot of people use that as the social element. And so like, Correct. again, if you're using it in moderation, that's it's the most boring thing to say when it comes to fitness. Like what are the top tips for fitness? Well, mostly you could say, uh, most things are fine in moderation. As long as you're not going overboard. Uh, I totally, I could never argue against the two things that you said. I think those would yeah. be, uh, super, super relevant. And so, you know, when I fast forward in my own life, I don't know, 20, 30 years, I'm like, I don't know if I really want to retire. Like I would need something to do, even if I did retire, like I'm going to find some type of, right. I don't know, job racked. I don't know, real estate investing. I don't know, like something, I need something to do. I can't just I don't know, turn it all off, I suppose. Right. Right. I think retirement is one of those odd kind of words that doesn't resonate with very many people. Retire. Think about the, the word retire. It's like moving away from versus mm -hmm. moving towards something. You know, that's yeah. what I think is it's just a transition period of one's life. Um, I know Chip Conley. Um, I got to meet him over at a conference over at Harvard a few weeks ago, and he has a whole philosophy about midlife transitions and how important it is to be able to reestablish mm -hmm. your North Star and be mindful of the fact that your okay. body and your age and your spirit is all going through a different transition at that particular time. So uh, Nick, this is great stuff. Um, I think that the, the common thing that I'm hearing here is, you know, whether people are listening to this podcast going, hey, I'm really into fitness or I'm not, certainly the common denominator is energy and that life oh, yeah. force. And if we don't have that uh, we're not going to be moving forward in any domain. I know there was an interesting book that I read a while back called um, The Powerful Engagement. And one, you would think it was a, a time management book. It's really not. It's a book about energy. It's a book about how to increase and keep your energy high because the idea is that when your energy is high, you're going to get a lot more done. You're going to be a lot more healthy and you're going to be uh, a lot more productive. Now, of course, the right kind of energy. You can be frenetically energetic. You can be worried energetic. You know, those are probably the negative sure. yeah. forces of energy, but the positive forces of energy. And I could see that, you know, you're in the business of energy in some ways. You're in the, in the business of being able to uplift that, that natural human energy that we all need and we all have to have in order to be successful. Yeah. Real, a real quick note on the energy, on the energy front and, if you've ever dieted before, you might have noticed that like energy levels do start to go down a little bit. And something that I picked up on and I try to remind myself, like I, I recently this past weekend uh, was a little under the weather. I got back from traveling and I don't get sick very often, but I was definitely a little under the weather. And so what happened was I just found myself laying around more often. And I find that the more I do that, the less energy that I have. And so it just, it's like this weird self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing yes. where then I don't really want to do anything. And then like I continue to not want to do stuff. Whereas a lot of times if you can just, and this is for folks that maybe aren't super into fitness yet, but some people think that they you kind of, you're always motivated and that's absolutely not the case. Sometimes right. you just got to take those first couple steps to get moving and get some of that energy going and then it right. becomes easier. But it's like, usually that first step is the hardest one. And then once you get a little momentum, it starts to get a little bit easier. And I think the same principles apply a lot to business. If you wanted to start something, it's like, it's really hard to get started. But then once you do get, you know, moving in the right direction, get a little bit of momentum, things can get a little bit easier. So hopefully there's a lesson there for people that are listening, whether, you know, you want to get started in, in fitness or business. Yeah, I love that. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the, going back to this idea about, energy is it's so important to know that there is the exertion of energy that takes place I and mean, if you take the metaphor and the reality of weightlifting that's an exertion of energy 
Um, but there's also the other part, which is the repair. It's the rest. It's the recoiling. It's the it's the nurturance of all that. And that's I go back to this mm-hmm. book again, which he was studying uh, the difference between how business in our Western cultures addresses productivity and how professional sports addresses productivity. And they're very different systems and they're very different approaches to energy management. The latter, the professional sports people, are all about understanding energy management and knowing the importance of rest and relaxation. You don't see a baseball player throwing nine innings every game, right? We we have sure. time to put our arm in a sling with ice and take a nap and whatever. But at work, we sort of hold up as the examples of great leaders as those that in effect do do that <laughs> day in and day out. And we greet each other with, well, how are you today, Nick? Well, I'm really busy. You know, that's the way we orient ourselves is around overextending our energy versus valuing the repair. And you know, we give back billions of dollars in the United States to our companies by not using the vacations that we've been granted. Um, it's just an amazing thing. So I think your, your point's really well taken yeah. is that it's a, it's a lot. It's about energy management. And part of it's about knowing when to rest. 100%. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not, it's just weird thing. Sorry, this will be the last point here to kind of wrap up on. It's super important because yeah. I literally had this conversation yesterday of, uh, you know, it's okay to do like one or two, maybe like big things for the day and not have your calendar completely filled to the brim because you do actually need some downtime in between. And like, if you're doing the right things and you're focusing on the couple main things that are moving the needle, you don't necessarily have to have your calendar filled with, you know, meetings every 30 minutes and all this stuff. It's like, you can just do a couple things and then you've got, you know, time to rest in between. It's, it's the whole idea of like deep work and you you can't deep work eight, 16 hours a day. That's not happening. You you might get four hours out of the day with that. And if you use those four hours wisely, man, you've, you've got a full day's work worth of work right there. Yeah. There was I I don't know. Again, another reference I was just thinking about as you were talking, Nick, it was, uh, I think it was, Oh, geez. Um, Daniel Pink, I think, did some research. He's really big into motivation, but he had another book that was talking about, I think, essentially biorhythms. He essentially that 80 percent of the population um, will find their best work in when it comes to highly cognitive in the morning. And then somewhere around noon, it drops off to be more rote, you know, sort of things that don't require a tremendous amount of mental focus, uh, things that are easy to do, but needed to be done. And then in the afternoon, evening, we get another surge of energy. That's not so much about mental cognition, but it's more about vision. And that that was what the studies were talking about. And I thought, well, that kind of fits at least me. I can sort of almost Mm -hmm. plan that, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon, um, depending on how the day went, my energy is not going to be as high as it was at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. So you can almost schedule your life around how your yeah. energy flow naturally happens. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, Nick, it's been great to, to get to know you. Uh, great conversation. Uh, finish up with how can people connect with you, follow you, uh, know more about what you're about? Yeah. So I think the best spot is uh, go to YouTube and search Renaissance Periodization. I know it's a bit of a mouthful there. If you just search Dr. Mike, anything related to fitness is probably going to come up and you'll recognize my buddy's got a fairly large head. He's he's bald. And uh, (laughs) I I will say uh, he's very colorful. We'll use lots of colorful language. And for the vast majority of people, that is insanely appreciated. They, They like the humor. I will just throw that caveat in case someone goes there for the first time and it's like, whoa, I didn't expect some of this. Uh, it makes it very okay. light, light, lighthearted and, and funny to, to do that. So, yeah, our YouTube channel is absolutely a great spot. And then uh, if you'd like to you know, connect with me personally, uh, Instagram at nick.shaw.rp is the, the best spot for that. Well, it's been great to chat with you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, likewise. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You bet.